As Jesus went about, his, went about with his disciples, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God with signs, wonders, power, and authority, some Pharisees came up from Jerusalem. Now understand, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. They were not the party that was in charge, the party in the majority, if you will, but they were a significant, uh, they made up a significant representation of the, of the beliefs in Jerusalem. And they were considered religious, of the, religious leaders of the day because they were considered to be an exceedingly righteous. Specifically, they believed themselves to be right with God. And as these Pharisees gathered around Christ, they noticed that his disciples were eating food with hands that were still defiled. For you see, the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. So understand that it wasn't that the disciples hadn't washed their hands. It was that they had not ceremonially, ceremoniously cleaned themselves before the meal. Further, the Pharisees believed and observed many other ceremonial washings, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And they did all of this because of defilement. They were trying to cleanse themselves from defilement. So confounded by the disciples' apparent defilement and wondering at Jesus' tolerance, his lackadaisical approach to this impurity, they asked him, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah the prophet was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. He said, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to mere human traditions. This morning, we're going to continue our examination of the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God in Mark chapter 7. And as we examine this text in Mark chapter 7, starting about verse 5, we're going to look at this question asked by the Pharisees and the response that Christ gives. But it is also imperative that we consider the question behind the question, the question that is implicit within their own question. And that question is, what is it that I should live by? You see, the Pharisees believed they had the answer. I believe Christ, in his gospel, in the coming of the kingdom, represents a superior one. So this morning, if you will, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. We're going to start off in verse 5. That's Mark chapter 7, verse 5. And let us examine both the question and the question behind the question. And so in Mark chapter 7, verse 5, the text tells us clearly what his, their question was. Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? I draw your attention to the first part. Why don't your disciples live? What is it that we live by? What is it that they were expected to live by? God's word provides us the answer. All throughout the Old Testament, the Jews were warned to keep the law of Moses. This law was also known as the covenant at Sinai. And this is the covenant or the contract that God made with the Jews at Mount Sinai. If you will recall, and if you're in my Wednesday night class, I apologize because we've been going over this ad nauseum. So you're very well aware. But if you will recall, Moses led the Jews out from Exodus. He led them out from under Pharaoh. And God did all of these miraculous signs and wonders. And the Jews ended up with Moses at Mount Sinai where God's presence descended on the mountain. And he gave to them the law or the covenant, this contractual agreement. And the contract was simply this. I will be your God if you obey me. That was simply it. The terms were simple. Obedience. The Jews were to obey God at all times. All throughout the Old Testament, the Jews were warned again and again and again, keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them, according to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 6. 
and many other places, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Nehemiah chapter 9, I and mean, we go on and on and on. This was a warning that was given constantly to the Jews. And it seems simple enough. Yet what we find in the scriptures, and brothers and sisters, our own lives bear this out. It's much easier to say that I'm going to keep a law than to actually do it. You see, the standard that was set at Sinai was one of perfection. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, the Jews are warned, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, if you have never told a lie, raise your hand. Okay. Let's try this one on for size. If you never, ever, in anything you said or did, dishonored your father or your mother, raise your hand. So then Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 26 would apply. Cursed are you, and cursed am I. You see, the standard that was set forward in the text was keep the law perfectly or die. You see, brothers and sisters, both of those, whether we lie or whether we honor our father or our mother, both of those were in the Ten Commandments. And the penalty for violating one of the Ten Commandments was death. It was that simple. In other words, brothers and sisters, the law of God was given. And when it was given, it brought condemnation. Not because the law is evil. Not because what God gave was bad or there was something wrong with it. But because without Christ, we are all under the power of of sin. And this is where the Pharisees went wrong. This is where they misunderstood. See, they thought to deal with sin and defilement themselves through their own rules and regulations. Imagine for a second, the standard is to keep the law and to keep it perfectly. And if you violate the law, you are under condemnation. How is it possible then to fix that problem? Think about it this way, brothers and sisters. I'm going to give you an analogy. Many of you know I went down to Alice recently to do a funeral. What you don't know is that I got pulled over by the cops on the way there. Well, actually, in point of fact, after I had already done the funeral, after I had done the graveside service, I was headed back into Alice to meet the family, and I got pulled over by the, uh, the sheriff's department. And it scared me. <laughs> I'm driving along, getting off the highway, and right there in Alice, like, like a lot of these cities, they have these areas where you're off the highway, but you, don't, you can't really tell all the time. And that's no excuse, because I used to work EMS in Alice, so I should have known. I got off the highway, my son's asking me questions in the back, I'm trying to make it to the area where they said we're getting together to, to have a meal together, and the next thing I know, there are flashing lights in my rearview mirror. And I go... And I pull over, and now my son, he's got all these questions, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm a preacher. I'm just on my way back from a funeral, and here I am getting pulled over. When the cop came to the window, you know what I didn't bother to say? I didn't bother to promise him I would never do it again. Not because I, I don't intend to ever do it again. It wasn't my intention to be speeding where I was, and it wasn't my intention to... to to be there and do that. It wasn't my intention in the slightest. But whether I liked it or not, I found myself having broken the law. And if I look at that police officer at my window and I say, well, officer, look, let me tell you right now, truthfully, I will never do this again. And let's say I keep my word and I never speed again. Does that fix the fact that I have already broken the law? 
Just because I may promise to never do something again doesn't change the fact that I've already done it. My daughter Allison is learning this lesson the hard way. She likes to um, (sighs) creatively remove sweets from their specified location. She likes to steal candy. Um, so she likes to steal candy, and it's funny, and she likes to steal cookies and sweets, anything with sugar in it, really. She, I mean, she just, she steals it. There's, I mean, if you're her Bible teacher during the day, you know, or um, here at the building, you, know, you understand why we're not allowing her to have sweets now, because she just unashamedly takes it. Um, and she, she has no problem taking it from other people, too. She, I mean, she, uh, she has decided this is the best way to go about getting candy. Um, and it's funny, because when we catch her at it, the first thing out of her mouth all the time is, I didn't do it. And following that is, I didn't want to do it. Right? But it doesn't change the fact that she has, in fact, done it. The Pharisees clearly did not understand the nature and power of sin. And they didn't understand the nature of law. The law, if you've sinned, there's no way you can go back. And our brother Mark just got up here and and read from Romans chapter 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a sin, by the way, to have your ringer on at church. I don't know if you... Okay. Um, but truly, truly, the Pharisees thought that they could handle defilement. They could handle sin. And not even by the law. They thought that they would just make up their own regulations. Have you ever tried that? You get pulled over by the police officer and you tell the police officer, well, but I've made up my own law. And this is not speeding here. Didn't you know, officer, that the speed limit here is by my own law. It's increased to 65. Do we understand what Jesus is telling these people? It doesn't work that way. It'll never work that way. You can't go back Once you've broken the law, you've broken it. You're done. You're a sinner. And the penalty for that sin is death. Do we understand what sin is? Brothers and sisters, I don't think they did. Do we? Romans chapter 3, verse 9, it says, What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Now, Paul is talking about the Jews here. He says, Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are alike are all under the power of sin. It's a power. It's a terrifying power that no amount of ceremonial washing will cleanse us of. Do we understand that it is a king and that it reigns and it has a kingdom? In Romans chapter 5, verse 21, it says, so that just as sin reigned in death, it reigns through the power of death. Not only is it a king with a power and a kingdom, not only is it that, but it's a slaver. And it enslaves us, Paul will say in Romans It will say that it enslaves us. So it is a power, it is a slave master, it is a wicked king that exercises its power through death and destruction. Sin is a power that reigns, and it reigns in our hearts and in our minds. It rules over us as an evil despot in a kingdom of darkness. Do you not hear Colossians chapter 1? where Paul says that it is by the kingdom of God, by the power of Christ, that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light. Sin leads us along paths of destitution and destruction, waging a constant, a constant campaign against what we know we ought not to do. The Pharisees knew they had sinned. They knew they were defiled, but instead of coming to God and looking to Christ who stood in front of them, instead of looking to Him to solve the problem, they thought to solve it themselves. On our own, brothers and sisters, at the very first infraction, we were sold into sin's power. Prisoners chained in a kingdom of despair and darkness as we suffocate under the weight of our own depravity, hating everything that we are. And in the end, we know that no matter how hard it is, we fight. 
no matter how hard we struggle on our own, sin will win. And we are destined to die for the things that we have done. Brothers and sisters, hear me. No amount of human rules or regulations can fix what is already broken. The speeding ticket has been written. The candies and the sweets have been eaten. Sin has been committed. And this is what the Pharisees do not understand. They do not understand that the problem is not about an external defilement, but an internal defilement. The problem, brothers and sisters, is our hearts. Don't you recall what King David wrote in Psalm 51? After he had so wickedly behaved towards Uriah and Bathsheba, Psalm 51, he writes, Create in me, Father, a pure heart, O God. Create in me a pure heart. Because it is from within, from our heart, that evil thoughts come. All of these evil come from inside us and defile us. You see, the problem is not law. The law merely helps us understand that we are in fact sinners. The problem is us. The problem is our hearts that have been sold into slavery to sin. David correctly identifies in Psalm 51 the solution we need a new heart. And that is what the Christ and the kingdom of God aims to do. The Christ and the kingdom of God aims to destroy the power of the enemy and save men from the kingdom of darkness. Jeremiah speaks of this coming event as the time of the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, he prophesies, God will put his law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Because this is the standard. This must be what has to happen. This must happen for us to lead a life that pleases God. Brothers and sisters, we need a new heart. And God is the only one who can provide that. Standing before the Pharisees is Christ. The one that the prophets had spoken of. The one that had come to establish his kingdom, to establish a new covenant where we find forgiveness, true forgiveness of sins, true redemption, true righteousness. Not because of what I have done or what I strive to do, but because of God and Christ and his work. Standing before Christ, the Pharisees want to know, why don't you follow us and live in our depravity? Brothers and sisters, I tell you now, do not be deceived. No amount of law, no amount of human tradition, no amount of doing it our own way can save us from the power of sin and death. But thanks be to God that now by grace, through faith in Christ, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because it is by the power of Christ that we have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. It is by the power of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and our obedience to him that has created a new heart within me and within you if you have put on Christ. going forward brothers and sisters don't rely on your own power or on your own authority do not think that you can approach God by your own standard the Pharisees found out the hard way that day that it would not work that way Christ said I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but through me Paul will warn the Galatians that for all who would seek to justify themselves under the law The blood of Christ is nothing to them. We work, brothers and sisters. We obey. We do the things that we do, the good works that he has called us to, not to be justified. We do those things because they are a response to the justification that he has given us through Christ. (sighs) 
In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, he says, Christ says, he comes, this is after his crucifixion, crucifixion, after his resurrection, he comes to his disciples and he says, I have been given all authority under heaven and earth, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. In Acts chapter 2, Peter confirms this. He confirms the gospel, the coming of the kingdom of God, and he says, let all of Israel know that Jesus, this man that you crucified, is now seated at the right hand of God. He is the Lord and Messiah whom you crucified. And the Jews look at him and say, brother, what shall we do? And Peter looks at them and says, nothing, that's it, you're good. Go ahead and go. No, that was it, you just had to, you had to know it. No, no. Peter said to them, repent. Repentance does not mean feel bad about your sin. That usually accompanies repentance, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a good thing, but repentance literally means to turn from what you were doing, from your human tradition, from the laws that you think are going to justify you. Turn from those things and begin to follow Christ. Repent and be baptized. That's immersion. Be immersed by the power and authority of Christ. Submitting to Christ in baptism because he is king. Put your hope and your faith in him who is king and you will be forgiven of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not only does does repentance and baptism mean the forgiveness of our sin, not only is it for the reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit, But it is in this process that the sinful nature, our enslavement to sin is cut away as Paul teaches in Colossians chapter 2. In Romans chapter 6, Paul reminds us that it is in our baptism that we died with Christ to sin and are risen to walk in a newness of life. It is in our baptism that we are buried and raised to walk anew. If you have not put on Christ... In a second, our brother is going to get up and we're going to sing a song. If you have not repented, if you have not put on Christ in baptism, if you have not made this appeal, as as Peter will say, he'll say, baptism now saves us, not the removal of filth from flesh. We're not taking a bath. It's not a ceremonial washing, but it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience. If you have not been freed from the kingdom of darkness and despair, a kingdom that ends in our death, I ask that you come forward as we stand and as we sing. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask the elders to come forward. We do have...